All righty. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, there's a bunch of chairs over here if um, you're having trouble finding one. Um, I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and I am very, very pleased to welcome you all to Seattle for the uh, spring uh, 2015 CNI member meeting. Um, I'm glad to see so many people here. Um, I am also delighted that I have not heard tell of um, uh, nasty travel surprises that sometimes um, uh, we encounter. Um, you know, um, April blizzards or things of that nature that wouldn't be uh, out of uh, character with the winter we've had, at least in some parts of the country. Um, so uh, I am delighted you're all here. I'm going to be very brief. I have just a couple of administrative kinds of announcements, and you will find all of these echoed on the, um, the announcement board by where you uh, picked up your badges and programs. Um, the Fifth Avenue room sort of isn't happening, and everything that was in the Fifth Avenue room um, has been moved to Cascade A and B. Cascade A and B is on the third floor, one level down. You can get there by escalator or by um, elevator. Uh, so whenever in the program it says Fifth Avenue room, read Cascade A and B. Uh, we have one um, cancellation. Uh, that is the session um, on the IMS uh, learning analytics work that was scheduled for 5.15 um, this afternoon. Uh, so that session will not be taking place. And I would just remind you that um, uh, if we run into any other relocations or rescheduling, um, we will post it uh, by, the, um, by the registration desk. Uh, there should also be a um, list there of the sessions that we're going to be trying to uh, capture um, video uh, for, just for your reference. And having done those brief announcements, uh, now I get to the good stuff. Uh, I am just incredibly pleased to be able to welcome Brewster Kale back to CNI. Um, some of you know Brewster as a treasured colleague and a um, leader within our community going back, um, uh, well, we were just talking about that, let's just say a long time, and uh, neither of us are looking quite as young as we were, although um, he's doing much better than I am. Uh, but um, uh, Brewster has done incredible things. Um, uh, some of you may know his early work on distributed information retrieval systems, uh, uh, now just, you know, sort of woven into a lot of our um, fundamental assumptions about things. All of you, I'm sure, know at least some of the work of the Internet Archive of how he stepped in and um, uh, took up the challenge of preserving this strange and um, wonderful new thing called the World Wide Web as it started to emerge. Um, some of you uh, may be familiar with other initiatives that he's undertaken since, and I think he'll fill us in on uh, some of those. Um, Brewster is someone with a great commitment to information access uh, worldwide, a uh, great commitment to um, stewardship and preservation in order to support that access. Um, one who has thought very hard and tried to find hard ethical balances in um, situations that nobody's been in before um, about uh, uh, the collection and archiving and uh, subsequent access of information. Um, he genuinely is one of my uh, personal heroes, and um, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome him back today. I'll just say one other thing by 
just, just maybe as context to some of what I think he's going to talk about. Um, we've relied on Brewster and the Internet Archive for leadership and really even more than leadership, just being out in front, um, you know, all by their own um, uh, in the wilderness sometimes um, for a really long time. And um, as things get ever more complex, as scale gets ever larger, um, I think that he's been thinking a lot about how to get a broader collaboration going, about how the kind of scale of the problems we're facing today, the challenges, is outgrowing you know, any, institu any single institution. And so um, I think that um, you know, we've benefited from the pathfinding of the Internet Archive for a long time. Uh, one of the things that we're increasingly recognizing, I would say, in this last decade are the themes of collaboration and sustainability. And I think he's going to give us a lot to think about in connecting path blazing on one side and collaboration and sustainability as necessary survival strategies on the other. Welcome back, Brewster. Thank you, Cliff, and it's, it's wonderful to, to, to be back. Um, I was given the opportunity to speak here now, I guess, 12 years ago, and really what we ended up doing was kicking off the Open Content Alliance. This was in the era when, when the Google Library project was really just getting going, and the question is, is how are we going to react? And, um, well, we as the library community came together, um, formed organizations, and uh, got together and, and got moving. And there are now two and a half million books um, now publicly bulk downloadable, um, uh, also integrated into with Hathi Trust, but also available um, for open access as well. And it's, um, and it's an outcome of, of CNI. Um, and so I'd like to say thank you to CNI uh, for continuing what it is you do in all these ways. Thank you. I thought something that might be helpful today <clears throat> is to try to deal with the, era, the issues around modern materials, things that may have rights to them, probably have rights issues to them, um, at least has consternation and questions around it. And the idea of, um, for this, uh, this talk, and, and there's going to be some time for Q&A, the idea of what can we do um, often together um, in ways that maybe we would feel that we didn't want to do on our own, or what is now technologically or within the legal framework as it's currently evolving, is sort of okay to do. So I'm going to suggest a, uh, um, and go over a couple of the different paths that we've gone down with partners um, towards bringing modern materials um, into our digital collections and trying to offer broad public access to it and sort of what's happened out of, out of that. So the Internet Archive. Internet Archive is an inter is a independent nonprofit. So it's not part of a university, not part of the government. Um, it's about $12 million a year um, kind of organization. Um, it's 501c3 uh, non uh, nonprofit. I would say we started out being an archive of the internet. So the idea is to collect the World Wide Web and whatever it else was going to become this internet thing. Um, and try to make that permanently available and permanently accessible to people um, and users and as, as well as bots. But we have longed to become an archive on the internet. So not just uh, constraining ourselves to things that were available to be hoovered in, but uh, to go into books, music, video, um, software, and, and, and the like. And most recently, and so this is just a portrait of the internet archive, then I'll go back to the... the, the um, uh, the adventures of trying to bring these things up. Um, we found really what we're trying to do is build libraries together. I, I like to play games where there are lots of winners. Uh, the idea of having a monopoly library or, or a monopoly of any particular content set, I find actually deeply scary. It's, 
oh, we'd like to be, a, I'd like to be a participant in this, but we don't want to be the only one. In fact, we want hundreds of them. We want lots and lots of libraries to flourish. And the technology, which might have been very difficult and went for centralization over periods of time, I think we can go and reverse some of these trends and build our libraries together with some of the original ideas of, of distributed collection criteria and, and services um, in an era which seems more like, isn't a library just a cloud service we subscribe to someplace? It's like, emphatically, no. Let's go and uh, make libraries, plural, um, happen and flourish uh, together. So with that, I'm going to I'm going to go through the um, some of the programs that um, that we've been involved in, all in partnership with others, um, and then say a little bit of sort of how have we survived these. We see ourselves within the tradition of traditional libraries. Um, I love what people carve above doors. So this is what's carved above the door of the Boston Public Library and um, is free to all. And it was carved by the robber barons, which weren't very nice folks, I, as I understand it. Um, they, um, and they were pretty controlling, but there was something about libraries and the information in them that was important to spread uh, far and wide. Um, we started by crawling the World Wide Web, and the idea was to try to uh, make a snapshot of every web page from every website every two months, starting in 1996. So a snapshot, then another snapshot, then another snapshot, another snapshot, and it's starting to get big. <laughs> um, uh, <clears throat> but it, it, uh, when we started this, um, our lawyer friend said, bad things are going to rain on you. Right? Just going and telling people that you're making whole scale copies of other people's websites, not even doing anything with it, was going to be a very bad uh, thing to do. Um, so we reached out and it, uh, Library of Congress wasn't quite ready for it yet, but the Smithsonian was. And so we worked with the Smithsonian and um, they gave us a letter with the little sunburst on it and said, we're proud to work with this organization that I think was three of us or four of us at that point, um, to go and collect the presidential election websites of 1996, because it's important to the mission of the Smithsonian. And David Allison of the Smithsonian knew exactly what he was doing. He was giving us cover. He was spreading his wing to a little organization that needed cover because all the recommendations we got was bad things would happen. Well, it turned out bad things didn't happen. And we started collecting along and everything was fine. Um, and then we basically said, well, what, what's the next step we can do? Let's make it even more available. And in the year 2001, we made the Wayback Machine. So we then took everybody else's stuff and we offered it for free on the internet for anybody to have access to it. So, uh, okay, so there's a little theme. So what do you think our lawyer friend said? What would happen to us? Bad things would happen to us. Um, so, um, so what did we do? Larry Lessig, um, and uh, actually it was in, we launched it in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley with all the wood around it. Um, and it was, you know, Tom Leonard was there and it was, it was the whole um, situation. They knew exactly what they were doing. They were putting their umbrella on top of this little organization that had just gone and without permission collected, I don't know, a billion web pages by then um, and made, we're going to make them uh, available on the internet. And it turned out bad things didn't happen. People used it up a storm. A lot of people wanted things taken out of the Wayback Machine, but it was all onesie twosie things. It wasn't, you have to take everything out. Um, and frankly, it was really helpful that nobody dragged us in front of a, uh, a judge because I really didn't want to have to argue uh, with a judge uh, um, that, you know, yes, we should go and try to get permission for every web page on every website every two months. I mean, it just wouldn't have been practical. So actually just having the world sort of continue along was, was incredibly Im important. Um, but there were very few people that wanted to come along with this on this journey. The Library of Congress went and um, commissioned us to go and collect some things for them, but they were very nervous about the Wayback Machine coming out um, and publicly. They, they, didn't, they thought they could bring down the whole edifice of doing anything by being too public with it. But when the Washington Post wrote it up as a good thing, 
then suddenly everybody was happy. And the reason why I'm saying this is not because, um, gosh, weren't they wrong, ha, ha, ha. No, 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 no. It's completely natural. This is exactly what really does happen, is people are like, they're kind of worried about it. It's like, well, what's going to happen? And we don't know. And you just have to kind of put it out there. And in retrospect, it all seems very silly and easy. At the time, it's scary as hell. Um, and so this is a, a situation that did work, and we now have um, pets.com. And thank God that we collected CNI in 1997. <laughs> Ta-da! Um, and, and you can actually click through and see what it is we're going to be on the agenda um, uh, then. And we've gotten uh, good, you know, things to come of all of this. There's even uh, the White House would have press releases that would say that President Bush, by standing on an uh, aircraft carrier, that combat operations in Iraq have ended, and then a couple days later change the press release um, to say major combat operations. Have, was there any note saying we changed the press release? No. Um, this was found by uh, users of the Internet Archive um, um, and, and sort of surfaced as to sort of, hey, isn't this great? But at this point, there's still only one. Then we basically built a tool to work with others. And we built a, a, a web archiving tool that people could download and use, Heratrix, and a lot of people have done that, but it's kind of a pain in the neck. So a lot of people subscribed to the Internet Archive to go and build tool, uh, collections on the Internet Archive that they could then take away with them. Um, this is at a time when people are, most people in like the national libraries were still not doing any public access to their web collections. They might have started collecting, but they didn't provide any public access. But this is state libraries and state archives, universities have come together. There are now 350 partners that are going and doing web archiving collectively. And I think it's a little bit like those sort of pictures in Cairo, you know, when everybody was in Arab Spring was sort of standing together arm in arm and taking a step forward. And it's that kind of a moment that we can collectively go and build services that aren't necessarily centralized. You say, well, this is a centralized service, but it does allow these materials to be back downloaded and you can run your own tools to be able to go and use these for your own research um, uses. So the idea of, of collective tools for distributed collections was really what it is what we wanted to do. And by operating together, because we've got a very peer-oriented group. That there's just, our, our field is peer-oriented. We look side to side as to what is okay. Often we sometimes check with our bosses, but you know maybe not as often as we should. We look to sort of what else are people doing, and the idea of doing this worked quite well. So one uh, joint collection is the Japan disasters of 2011, and people came together very quickly after, as the tsunami happened to go and collect these things together. And so there's all this wonderful materials. Archive web pages no longer available. Archive web pages no longer available. The collection is now quite large by a sort of subject focus, and the, um, the National Diet Library in Japan didn't feel that it could go and do crawling without asking permission. So they were thrilled that we were doing it, and they made this big ribbon cutting ceremony for us to come back and present into their collection the, um, this, the, this document of what happened in their country because they didn't feel that it, they could do it uh, themselves. So I'd say this is an example of our working together and making things uh, go right. I'm gonna give a few more examples of this. Television. In 1976, the ATRA Act um, said the Library of Congress was supposed to go and um, archive television. And as best I can tell, um, in 1996, the major outcome of this was a report saying, oops, we didn't do it. Um, but it's really important, and we should do it. Um, so uh, we hit the record button in the year 2000. Russian, Chinese, Japanese, Iraqi, Al Jazeera, BBC, CNN, ABC, Fox, 24 hours a day, DVD quality. We didn't ask permission. And bad things didn't happen. Um, but, the, but we just held on to it. And the question is, what could we do with it? 
And um, one of the hero librarian stories, in, I think, is the Vanderbilt Television News Archive that started archiving television and just before the Democratic National Convention in 1968 um, and was lending out television to uh, researchers. And they were sued in the early, uh, in the early 70s, and I paraphrase, um, your, <clears throat> your Honor, New York has to shudder um, be, capitalism is over because a library made a, a librarian made a copy, and the judge did not concur. And uh, what what came out of it was an exemption in the 1976 Copyright Act. But Vanderbilt kept on it, and they basically got this little exemption to allow lending of television news. So the Internet Archive, building on the shoulders of, of Vanderbilt, um, uh, built a service a couple of years ago to go and lend television news so that you can go and search and try to find uh, materials. Um, you can search and find clips and embed in your blogs. Or if you wanted the whole, whole program, you could borrow it on DVD. We stamped a DVD and sent it to you. And the question is sort of, isn't that clunky? Wouldn't you just do a download? It's like, yeah, we'd want to do a download, but we're trying to be respectful. We're trying to basically find a way that doesn't interfere with the business models of the broadcasters, but not only has preservation happen, but having um, access happen. And it turns out that this has worked actually very, very well. Uh, we haven't had anybody complain. In fact, the, um, the news organizations are really thrilled because now they have access to their old collections, and they've been asking for uh, data dumps of the closed captions so they can do data mining over their own news programs. And so it's actually turned out to be fine, that, it's, um, that it, it, it has worked. How do we do this? We gathered a bunch of, um, of scholars before we did this. We, we held a conference that was supported by the Knight Foundation. Um, the Knight Foundation was very nervous about this whole program, um, but we got this together, got all these, these researchers say, it's absolutely critical, we need to know all of this. Um, that, was, that was helpful to sort of set a context. We came out with it, New York Times thought it was a terrific thing, and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and others seemed to think so too. Um, and then the Knight Foundation came back and funded um, a further program of going forward, and now we're having a bunch of different support that's been going on to try to help understand the influence of money and political ads in American uh, uh, elections. And I've got a real downer quotation, actually, from this, this study that was just finished of watching all of the programs in the Philadelphia region. We recorded all of them, all of 20, uh, not just news, but also all the entertainment program, and found all the political ads and then counted them up. And then uh, and the University of Delaware went and also found all of the political news on all of the news programs in the Philadelphia area. So political ads versus television news in terms of the number of minutes for every one minute of television uh, news about the political, we had 45 minutes of political ads. It's just devastating what's going on, and it's the first time this type of thing is known. What I find interesting about this is it's not just retrospective looking, it's trying to make our libraries useful in the current issues of the day. So it's not like a, gosh, glad you did this, you know, somebody in the future is gonna be really, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. No, right now, we need this for our public um, discussions. So we're now working with um, libraries all over um, to go and use these materials in new and different ways. And that's the sort of collective action, I would suggest, um, that is uh, really important. It's also starting to become affordable, which is, you kind of think of television as just so darn gigantic. How can it possibly be affordable? Uh, we have about three million hours, I think it's around nine petabytes of data. But if you take one channel a year, it's only 10 terabytes. That's a little bit bigger than the current hard drives. The, the current hard drive you can buy now is eight terabytes, which is kind of amazing. That almost is a channel year. So at a channel year, you can do this too. And your computer scientist guys are gonna love it, and your digital humanities guys are gonna do it, and we can do it in a distributed way, or we can work together and share the results. So this is another example of, I think, kind of going forward, we can go and have our libraries become not just subscribers to other people's services, 
but to actually have services ourselves and to go and do our own collecting and, and doing it. The next step that we went into was music. And the whole question of, of what do you do about music? This was back in sort of 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003. There were just lawsuits all over the place. This is sort of the time of Napster. And so, of course, we asked our lawyer friends, and we, they said, oh, what's going to happen to you is going to be bad. Um, um, so we, we tried to find some way around this by finding people that actually wanted things to happen. And we went with, um, there's a tape trading um, communities. Uh, actually, this is an, an intern that was uh, working at the Internet Archive. He came forward and said that, you know, Brewster, the, the Grateful Dead started this tradition of, of tape training. Oh, yeah, I had my cassettes, right, back, back in the day. He said, it's still going on. It's going on on the Internet. I said, really? And he said, yeah, and there's lots of bands that copied it. And um, so and he said, why don't, you know, Bruce, you keep talking about going and, you know, being storage for cultural materials. Why don't we talk to them? I said, great. Why don't you write them a note? Uh, these, these are the tape traders that, that were online. And, and she wrote a note. He said, um, <clears throat> we'd, we'd like to offer unlimited storage, unlimited bandwidth forever for free. Um, um, what do, you, what do you think? And they wrote back and said, we don't believe you. Um, uh, it's too big. But if you could do it, it would be our dream. It's always a good step when somebody says it'll be our dream. So we said, try us. And um, so we thought about it a little bit from the band's perspective. And just going and posting these up on the internet is different from tape trading. Tape trading used to be kind of a pain in the neck. It was kind of as bad as going to your town library, right? You had to, you, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a pain. And that, that meant that it didn't happen quite as much. So we asked some level of permission from the bands. We didn't go and ask our lawyers what was the uh, proper uh, form for them to sign, so we just asked for an email from anybody associated with the taper-friendly bands to just send us an email saying, yeah, it's okay. It could be the drummer, it could be the webmaster, it could be, you know, it could be, it could be anybody. And, um, but then we had somebody in that community say it's okay, and we posted their email response, and it worked. So we got two, three, four bands a day saying yes, and fans uploaded about 40 or 50 concerts a day. Now, you, I wouldn't have thought, starting the Internet Archive, that music concerts would have been a, a thing that we would have done. It was just responding to a need, that there were cultural materials out there, and it started to work. We now have 130,000 concerts from um, uh, 6,000 bands, and we have everything the Grateful Dead's ever done. Um, so it's, it's working. So it's a, it's a system that, that worked. We went on to do other internet-oriented distribution music. Before MP3, the format was standardized. There were other formats. And uh, one was distributed by the Internet Underground Music Archive. And we'd archived some of their web pages, but not all of it. And it turned out that um, uh, one of the founders of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, John Gilmore, had recorded all of it on a hard drive. And so he came up to us a couple of years ago and said, I have all of IUMA. We said, great! And uh, so we, we thought, well, can we find everybody? Should we ask permission? And it's like, no, let, let, let's just post it and, and see what happens. And, and if there's anybody unhappy, we'll, we'll take it back down again. So we, we took these albums from the early internet distribution, posted them, People were thrilled. The company had long been munched in acquisitions, and the, uh, and the uh, participants, the people that had posted music, were thrilled to see their music back. Often they didn't even have it um, themselves. So here is another case of working with a community to find sort of, is there some level of OK, and then um, uh, move forward. Also in music, we started working with net labels, which are internet era labels, and we have lots of them. And there were, by providing free hosting, that's been wor really worthwhile. We're now starting to work with CDs, LPs, and 78s. And here is where it's a little more problematic for us. And we're trying to figure out what to do. We're starting to spread our wings by working with a few um, uh, uh, labels, like I just put up, but also with these archives, like the Archive of Contemporary Music in New York. They've got two to three million audio recordings so that is just the motherlode. 
can we go and try to get those CDs uh, and, and, put, um, and LPs and put them up? And we're starting to get better at the digitization process. We asked your lawyers what would happen, and they said bad things would happen. Um, and it turns out that the preservation function hasn't uh, elicited that type of response. We're still trying to figure it out and get it going and um, trying to get it more, to be a more distributed project so that we can get lots of libraries taking their CDs and LPs, digitizing them, making themselves available to themselves and as cent in central repositories like ours. Our current idea is to go and have libraries go digital so that people can take their existing collections, put the CDs or LPs in some sort of machine, prove that they have it. If it's already been digitized, blink, they can have access to it as if they had digitized it. If, they have, is, if it hasn't been digitized, then digitize it, add it into the pool. Kind of like how we built OCLC back in the day. Can we go and build our music libraries together, but then allow people to have full download access to their whole collections in digital form? What you can do with it beyond that, we're not exactly sure, and it'll all evolve. But at least on campus access seems to be happening a lot. I get a lot of librarians going and saying, yeah, we, uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, we, we let it, uh, you know, everybody on campus can have it, but don't, don't tell a lot of people. And if I gathered all of those people up, I'd better be, I don't know, a third of the organizations that are represented in this room. So it's starting to happen. We've got a model for at least on-campus access. So, and the Internet Archive is doing that same kind of thing. Can we go and, as a collective group of us, bring our libraries digital? We brought our catalogs digital. Can we bring our libraries digital? I think that that is a great opportunity. So don't just go and have the Internet or, oh, it's all happening because they'll do it. No, we should do it. And then we could have access, and it's small. The amount of, of storage that it takes, even at high resolution, by computer standards, is quite uh, doable. We got 40,000, um, a donation of 40,000 uh, 78 RPM records, um, which we want to you know, thank Bavaria uh, Public Library for giving it to us. But really what I'd like to argue is, please don't get rid of your collections. Store them well. And store them maybe off-site, store them maybe in shipping containers. It's cheap enough to do as long as you don't have to have rapid access to it. Uh, we've figured out how to do inexpensive off-site storage um, so that you can hold on to your own collections. If you really don't want to hold on to your collections, then please donate them to the Internet Archive. And we'll, we'll, hold, uh, we'll hold on to them. So we just got uh, 50,000 LPs. Um, and we're getting better at sort of doing mass digitization of, of CDs uh, and LPs. Um, a user of this collection already, Daniel Ellis from Columbia University, had this to say, that basically they need access to comprehensive collections to do their new research. The type of research that Aaron Schwartz does of going and downloading a lot of materials and going and making, um, doing computer analysis is the norm. It's what we should be actively supporting. And we are now supporting uh, Daniel Ellis and a number of other um, researchers in the music world because we've got these collections put um, together. And we've gone and made these uh, available in-house in our cool little reading, uh, listening nook. Um, and nobody's had problems with it. So we're not just taking the CDs and putting them out on the net, um, but we're having them accessible on campus and looking for others uh, uh, to play with. I think this idea of standing together taking a step forward and doing it in a distributed way is a more robust, more resilient uh, mechanism of building these um, materials up. So audio collections is star now starting to grow and the Internet Archive is smaller than most of your, uh, uh, by budget or by staff, um, than most of your, your universities um, or organizations. Um, so you can do these sorts of things um, as well. Moving images. Most people think of Hollywood films. Um, most of this stuff is all tied up in enough rights, and it's actually fairly available anyway, so we've mostly stayed away from it. What we've gotten a lot better with is old materials, 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, home movies, those sorts of things. People love them. I have, I, it was a real surprise to me that actually people use, this is uh, stills from the Are You Ready for Marriage? You know those social behavior films um, uh, when we were in junior high school, when there was a, uh, 
when there was a substitute teacher and they, they'd reel in the 16 millimeter uh, uh, projector. Those, we have those. Um, and, uh, and they've been downloaded often hundreds of thousands of times because I think it's how a visual generation is trying to understand the 20th century not just from Hollywood perspective, but from home movies and these sort of e ephemeral films. Um, we're just now digitizing 7,000 films that were uh, donated um, by a major research university um, with the help of uh, Mellon and Clear Foundation uh, fellow to, to sort of watch over and get these things available. We learned to not ask enough lawyers to try to figure out what would happen if we put these things up on the offer because we just sort of channeled, they'd probably say that bad things would happen. Um, but we just haven't been finding this to be the case, that we basically deal back and forth with organizations if things come up and we just take them uh, down and it seems to be working out pretty well. We also offer unlimited storage for people to upload things um, and we just started to get inexpensive equipment and there's, um, and we're starting to do VHS tapes. So there was a commissioned um, report on what to do with VHS tapes and are they, you know, can we use section 108, something or other. Um, and I think the report basically said mm, no. So we just started to anyway. Um, and uh, so what we did is we just took VHS tapes that were from the San Francisco Friends of Public Library book sale, The Remnants, and we had volunteers look to see if it was available on DVD for sale new. In other words, is it currently being flogged? Not is it available on eBay, is it available new? And if it isn't, then we digitize it, we put it up, and it's worked fine. So we're trying to stay away from commerce, right? Trying to stay away from people's uh, uh, you know, valid business practices, um, but we're trying to make the older stuff available and everybody um, is thrilled. It turns out to be inexpensive, to digitize these materials, and we now have an awful lot of them up. Texts. So, as I, as I said, we started the Open Content Alliance, but mostly people were going for the out of copyright, but we wanted to do all of it. So the Library of Congress, maybe 28 million uh, books. A book is about a megabyte, that's 28 terabytes. That's four current hard drives. You can spend less than a month's rent and have the storage capacity for all of the words in the Library of Congress. Something new has happened. You guys can go and have these collections within your uh, collections, even if it's just for certain types of uses and you use other subscription services for certain access things. But the public domain should be um, uh, more publicly available. But we didn't stop with just the public domain, like these wonderful books of Euclid, um, and putting them on um, on digital tablets and the like. What we um, uh, did is start to just digitize, well, everything. Anything that we could afford to, uh, to digitize and then try to make as much access as we could. So we got good at digitizing inexpensively, got it down to around 10 cents a page. So $30 up for a 300 uh, page book. So $30 a book um, and thanks to the library community, Working together, we've worked with about 500 libraries now to build sort of an open version of the Google Books project. And I said before, we've gotten about two and a half million books uh, done through this sort of system. Um, and there are just some fabulous works out of rare book collections um, uh, working in China and something that I'm really happy about because I've been looking for a, uh, uh, a community, a, a, a nation, or a language group that would allow us to digitize everything in their language. <laughs> and just, can we just, would somebody go open? And the Balinese said yes. So we basically have been, we digitized all of the published works uh, in Bali, which is kind of neat. And what they do is they publish on palm leaves. And so, <laughs> and so it's palm leaf books, and this is, um, so we basically digitized by photographing with them all of their, of their books. And we said, okay, well, how do you read them? And we said, read them? Well, the priests read them, um, but sometimes they're read as things like shadow puppet plays. So this is actually a reading of one of their books, or there are performances. But I thought it was completely great that the first 
uh, group of people to say, I want to go online because it's going to be beneficial to our language and our culture, is um, where the Balinese. So we now have scanning centers all over the world. Um, they're close to people. Uh, it's not that expensive to do. We're coming out with um, a, a, a smaller scale portable scanner, so it's easier to do. Um, and we're starting to work through the rights issues. So we have maybe three million free e-books, but we have a million books that are available to the blind and dyslexic, because we can, um, and 300,000 that we're lending. So what does lending mean? So this is in copyright, non-rights cleared books that have been given to us by about 500 different libraries with the express purpose of digitizing and lending in copyright non-rights cleared books. This has been going on now for four years and there's been basically no problems. What it means to lend is that we try to buy books from publishers so that we can lend them, but they're not that psyched about doing that in general. So mostly we've been digitizing and lending. This is a book that we bought, but it's been checked out, so you can add it to your list. Um, here is a more obscure book um, from the Boston Public Library, but it's from 1990 something or other, and, um, and it is available to be checked out. You have a few different formats, and then you can borrow it, and you're the only reader of this for two weeks. So for two weeks, you're the only, everybody else is locked out of this book, and it's been going on just fine. So this is an approach towards working together to lend books, and we're lending people all over the world. What we'd really like to do is take your collections and bring them digital, and then you could lend things inside your own organizations, say. Wouldn't that be neat? So if, if this hard drive, this eight terabyte hard drive, can store eight million books, if you can keep a card catalog going that keeps track of your lent out books, then you can operate the technology to lend out digital books and make sure that it's only used within the whatever constraints possible. It would make us feel much more mm, safe, if you will, by working together and having lots work together. Other libraries are using our platform, but it's still kind of just us. But is there a way of spreading it so that there are lots of libraries that have their collections digital? And you can go and make it available, say, just to your computer scientists. Maybe you use the, uh, the local uh, consortia to go and put together, like in California, Khalifa is basically starting to operate um, shared lending facilities. Um, but it means that you're not beholden to somebody else. And I think that's going to be absolutely critical to have a robust library system going forward. Software. So in the software area, um, the, we've been starting to do large-scale collections. We believe we have 500,000 titles, but we don't have exp uh, all of the cataloging done. We have about 90,000 titles of, of PC software era software on our disks, working with different communities that have been doing the lion's share of work. So we're not doing the work. They are, and we're working with them in really interesting and new ways. And now we, they've based on some work that we did, again, with lots of volunteer communities, we got the first level of emulation to work so that you can go to a web browser, go and see a piece of software, say in my case it was VisiCalc, I'd never seen VisiCalc run. And you can go to a web browser, click run, and what it does is really surreal. It actually downloads in JavaScript a, a, an emulator for an Apple II, boots the Apple II, then it reads its virtual floppy that has the, uh, the, uh, the software on it for VisiCalc, and it's running. It's completely surreal to me, but it's possible now to run emulators in your browser, and it allows us to, in some sense, lend software. So, it's, so you're not really getting it, you're getting to use it, and it's not been a problem. We've been putting things up at, at a phenomenal clip, and we've been contacted by a lot of the, the producers that are still, if they're still flogging the materials, they want it taken down. And what do we do? We just take it down. And it works. So we've gone and put up tens of thousands of uh, pieces of software now up and running, and it's used by a generation that is just absolutely thrilled. Next up for us, personal digital archives. We're starting to not just 
go and do the digitization materials or the hard drive era collections of things, which is where my family keeps its photos. I'd say a lot of younger families are keeping their photos on Flickr and all of these other uh, not terribly stable uh, environments. And so we as libraries really need uh, to, to come together to start to figure out the tools so we can go and build the archives, say, of the professors or kids or our institutions. It requires being forthright and aggressive about uh, doing our jobs. And I'd say by, I haven't had people come to us and say, no, we don't want libraries anymore. And I haven't had people come to us and say, you're not a library, you're really a blank. It's like, no, you're really a library. We want libraries. Let's find ways for us to all move uh, forward together. So in conclusion, universal access to all knowledge. Say it's within our grasp, and it could be one of the great works of humankind. I think it could be remembered like the Library of Alexandria or the Gutenberg um, printing press as one of the terrific things that, that happened. But it's going to involve all of us. Um, and it really isn't something of just going, oh, look, Google's got that covered, or uh, it's a Hathi trust, they, no, no problem, I'll just subscribe to it. Not good enough. Um, it's really going to take us moving forward, and in fact, some of the projects, like the uh, Google Library project, got stopped as a monopoly. That was the reason why they stopped it in the courts. They said, that's not the library system we as a society want, is having one organization, the Books Rights Registry, controlling the distribution of out-of-print materials. That doesn't make sense. It's our turn. And fortunately, the technology has become inexpensive enough to, uh, to do things within our organizations or to do in clumps of them. We're working together uh, in different ways. And I guess lastly, carved above the door of the public library in Pittsburgh, the Carnegie Library, his legacy, um, is free to the people. Thank you very much. I hope that was provocative enough to get some questions going. Uh, I think I've, we've got maybe 10 minutes or so, um, so please. What should we be doing now? Yes, David. Hi, uh, I'm David Rosenthal. Uh, so uh, what let you deal with uh, books and uh, uh, software was in effect streaming. And it seems to me that this is, this, this is something which could be more generally uh, deployed to deal with the copyright issues. People have much less of a problem if you can't actually get a copy and squirrel it away, you just get the experience. I think streaming is um, a good intermediate step that has worked in a number of circumstances. Um, so uh, The Grateful Dead, um, we, we had all of their materials up, and the band sort of got nervous. Um, and they said, well, you should take it down. I said, we'll take it down, but <laughs> there are gonna be some really unhappy deadheads out there. Um, and so we, we took it down, and there was this big kerfuffle um, and that played out in the press and the, and the like. And what ended up happening is the sound, the audience recordings, they allowed to be downloaded. And the, sh the sound boards that were never those are direct patches of their, of their uh, sound. That was never really part of the tape trading deal. And those are available streaming. And that seems to work quite well. Even the book viewing is streaming. And it does sort of play an inter, um, uh, intermediate role. It's not that great, though, for research. So um, it, streaming isn't going to really make your computer scientists happy because they're going to have to scrape it and that's a pain in the neck. So I think having copies yourself of the materials so that you can go and make bulk access to ones that you feel comfortable uh, allowing bulk access to is tremendous. And going and depending on another organization, whether it's the Internet Archive to build all those research services, which we're in the process of, and so is Hathi Trust. But isn't that really what our universities should be doing? Um, is building some of those services and making some of these different interplays um, uh, available. So I'd say bulk access is important, but under con more controlled environments for the, um, for the uh, 
modern materials that are probably have rights issues, like television. I'd say that's exactly what it is we're doing with television. You know, the, the, the other issue with um, bulk access is that bulk these days is getting awfully big. And so moving the, <laughs> moving the, the, uh, the analysis to the data rather than moving the data to the analysis may end up being the only way you can cope with it, simply from the bandwidth and um, storage capacity issues. Yes, but let's not go and lock that into policy. I just don't no. want to have regulated that there's only going to be one or two copies of these materials. We want to make it so that the big boys could take copies away. And it's, it's somewhat getting easier. Moving terabytes around is easy. Petabytes, eh, yeah. it's still, still clunky. <laughs> uh, yes, and I, and I noticed that you only have a couple of copies of everything that you, you have, right? Yes, so we have two, two copies, then we have a partial copy in Amsterdam and a partial copy in Alexandria, Egypt. Yeah, that's a problem that needs to get fixed. Yes, I, I, I think there's somebody who said lots of copies keep stuff safe. <laughs> I, 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 I think we should agree with, with them, um, and, and, and we need help. I have kind of a related question to that, which is um, you, you mentioned a couple of examples where what people really want to do now is mine the large collections, but the truth is most researchers can't download the, the quantities of data and audio and content that you're collecting. So um, are you contemplating anything like the Hadi Trust Research Corpus, some kind of modality where people could actually do their research in your collections? Because I, I see that as the low-hanging fruit to get people excited about the stuff you're collecting. Um, yes, we've been doing different, different approaches towards trying to get researcher access. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've found is, so far, is big data usually means lots of data points, mm -hmm. not lots of terabytes. Um, that people still, even if you have access to it, they don't know what to do with it. What I think we need is a good middleware layer of open source software right. that makes it so that we can have digital humanities people not have to have a programmer glued to their mm -hmm. side um, to <laughs> be able to get some of their research done. Um, and we're exploring and trying to figure out building an institute uh, with fellows to go and build that middleware. Mm -hmm. Because we, we've sometimes gone and just opened it up. We, we took a, uh, one crawl of the World Wide Web. It was about 80 terabytes. And we just said, come and get it. Um, but tell us, you know, we'll, we'll give anybody a, a, um, a download key. You can, you can have access to it. And I don't know, 20, 25 did, um, got an access key. And we never heard from them again. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they did anything at all. Because um, it's just, it's kind of clunky and hard. Yeah. So I'd say we're, we're still in early stage in this, but let's do it together. Yep. Let's have some fun with it. So um, let's, let's go with uh, some of these different collections. Let's move them around. Let's build some open source software so that it's not just the land of the esoteric coders to right. be able to do like the studies like we were doing on the, um, on the TV news yeah. by doing all of those um, program, uh, finding all of the ads. That's actually a pretty cool master's level thesis. Right. Um, Let's get there. We have the data. Let's see what we can do with it. Um, and we can do some of it on our servers, but some of it on yours. Uh, how do we uh, make it all, all go, I think, is the opportunity that we should be pursuing now. You're here. Thanks. Thank you. So Elizabeth Jones, University of Washington. Um, so one of your refrains um, in this talk, which I thought was interesting, was um, lawyers said bad things would happen. No bad things happened. And, but a lot of the things that you talk about, a lot of people have gotten into trouble for doing sort of similar things. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to why the Internet Archive maybe hasn't gotten in trouble for doing these things as opposed to those other folks who have. Yeah, Paul Courant from Michigan. Uh, has, so why haven't you gotten sued? Um, and, 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 I, and maybe we're just lucky. I, I, I really, I can't tell you. Um, though we're very concerned about every aspect of what we do, and we try to be respectful, and we try to be open about what we're doing. We make no money out of, that, uh, out of this, so that kind of helps. What I've learned by going and collecting everybody else's stuff over the last 20 years and then making it publicly available, again, is the people don't want to feel like they're being taken advantage of. If they feel like they're being taken advantage of, they'll throw things at you, and laws are just one of them. They'll throw, they'll throw threats. They'll do all sorts of things to cause you to stop if they feel like you're being taken advantage of. So how do you do that? How do you deal? 
Um, one is do a really good job of what you're doing. Do it beautifully. Be respectful of, I mean, they spent a lot of time making that thing. Do it right. Um, so uh, in the software, uh, we've gotten a lot of the early software developers of these games thrilled because it's actually done um, quite well. So that's one. Don't make any money. And engage in, in conversation. Winston Tabb, when he was at the Library of Congress, um, when I was sort of being trained on how to do all of this stuff, he said, just remember, it's, all of, it's their stuff. Right? Be respectful. Um, and that's another characteristic. And we have a bend, not break policy. So where we probably could have stood our legal ground and faced somebody down and said, yeah, screw you, we didn't. Um, and sometimes it makes some people mad in our environment because we took things down that we maybe didn't really theoretically have to. But it's sort of just everybody's trying to figure out this digital transition. So we try to talk more to the business people than to the lawyers in these organizations um, and try to find ways to, uh, how can we make their business work better? Um, I think we've put a lot too much faith in lawyers figuring things out. Um, and it's just not going to happen. Laws tend to trail. New laws, when they're done hypothetically, tend to be really bad, especially for us. Um, it's, so I don't think laws are going to be done before we get there. We're going to have to get there, do things, and if there's enough trouble, then we'll have to bring in the legislators to go and figure it out. So I think we have to go and figure out what a library looks like. And I like the old style library where you have collections, you build collections, you serve your populace uh, really well, you pay publishers, um, you, you make things um, happen in a distributed way. I think we got brought into this digital collection idea back when, oh, uh, uh, an anecdote. I visited OCLC um, way back when, I think they were still called the Ohio Computer Library Consortium then, and <clears throat> they were run on Honeywell computers. And, um, and I asked, wow, how big is the database? They said, really large. And how big is it? Really big. And I said, in bytes. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, it's, uh, it's this many mark records. And uh, it's 17 gigabytes. Right? I was like, wow, it doesn't sound that big. Oh, well, you know, um, it, it, but it was a, a lot of maintenance to go and get that database really done well, right? I'm not saying that oh, it was you know, cheap to be OCLC. It never has been, never will be. Um, it's that the, uh, you don't need an acre of mainframes to run these data collections anymore. You can at least have copies much less expensively now. Going and maintaining it and keeping it up is, is as expensive as it always has been because it's people. Um, but the technology has made it so that there are certain things that we need to question our old assumptions about. Um, and we have opportunities beyond what it is we're currently doing. And I'd say we're arguing ourselves into not very good positions because of, uh, of our old habits in terms of understanding how to get things done. Let's build a distributed library system. Uh, Stephen Davis, Columbia University. Um, clearly, you've built one of the greatest knowledge resources in history. I don't think anyone can argue with that. Oh. And uh, it's Thank just you. amazing. It's just amazing. And, uh, um, over the last 10 or so years, um, many of us have been working in the area of digital preservation, long-term digital preservation. And a number of models and approaches and theories have, have, have been offered up, including the, the track certification and ISO follow-on. And then now Deepin is part of the landscape, or we hope it is. And uh, how does Internet Archive fit into that new framework for long-term digital preservation? Um, don't, don't really know. Um, the Internet Archive has been, I'd say, underfunded. I mean, I think all of us say we're underfunded, but I think we're like severely underfunded for what it is we're trying to do. And so we've kind of just bludgeoned forward to try to figure out how inexpensively we could do things. Um, and we try to do a good job and be transparent about it. And we're trying to come around a corner now. That, that third phase of building libraries together is really is driving our organization to be more engaged um, with uh, user communities and institutional communities. So with Deepin, for instance, I, you know, 
I know how to spell it, but that's probably about, uh, that's about as far. And it's not because it, it's not a good thing to do. It's, um, it's just been, um, we, haven't really, we haven't really gotten there yet. So please don't give up on us. Um, we're, we're better um, staffed now. Uh, Wendy Hanamura is in the front row. Is, is actually, we have now have a director of partnerships that can actually answer your emails. Because if you write an email to me, you, you, it's, it's iffy. Um, um, <laughs> So, uh, so I think there are, are roles for these different organizations and every country should at least have these. They, um, I know that uh, things are going on with our northern neighbor um, in terms of going and having uh, collections there too. And I highly encourage this. So encouraging, but we're kind of lame at the moment. So, so some deep in people will be getting in touch with you very soon. Thank you. So Booster. Um, Hi, Vicky. I couldn't let that last comment go. The comment of don't give up on us, meaning you. Um, in my, so, having been a librarian for a very long time, my definition of a research library is one which continues to build collections. And over the last two decades, many of the libraries that used to be research libraries really have fallen down according to that metric. More and more libraries lease access to content. More and more libraries, um, librarians care about the material that they pay large amounts of money for, which is not at risk at all and not the things that are freely available. And I would turn, I just want to say what's, what's amazing about your presentation right now is that you frankly haven't given up on this community and I hope they don't let you down. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know how it's going to go. Some people say that it, that the, the horse is out of the barn, that we're going to end up with YouTube, Elsevier, JSTOR, HathiTrust, the end. That being a university librarian is going to be contract negotiations and personnel issues. Uh, we're going to become customer service departments. Um, and I don't think that's the right way to go. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the shape is going to be. I don't a lot of our business models are wrong. That uh, we're, uh, if you're running a library, you're only really there to serve a local community. And how do we then go and change that so that I'm going to do the best ornithology server in the world? And I don't need to just serve Cornell with it. I can serve everybody. But how do we then go and pay for that? How do we get our business models adapting to distributed service provisioning that isn't really locally oriented? And I don't know the answer to this. Don Waters, who I, I hold in high esteem, I, I see you in the audience, he has won this darn argument for the last 20 years. I've been trying to make it so that we can provide universal access to all knowledge and be supported at it. And He's pointed out that it's very difficult to get libraries to pay for things that they'll get for free. Why would they? Um, yet, often distributed endlessly as opposed to subscription services work better in the internet generation. And I don't know how to square that, um, uh, that circle, that we've really got a, 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 a system that has the business models built around physical collections that are innately local. And, but we have now an opportunity of making services that every one of them is global, yet we have no mechanism to go and find a support mechanism for it. So as um, I think of the, the father of digital libraries, Mike Lesk put, um, the thing that he is worried about, he's worried about two things. He's worried about the 20th century because he thinks the 19th century and the 21st century are in pretty good shape, but the 20th century might get forgotten. Um, because of the copyright uh, issues. And the other is institutional responsibilities. What are we supposed to do? When you go back to your offices uh, next week, the question is, is, are you going to do something differently because of this 
it's hard to imagine because your constraints are the same as they were the week before. The opportunities are different, though. And how we respond to those opportunities is going to define how the library system looks in 10, 15 years when we're even a little bit grayer. Thank you very much.